so with that, let me turn over to Dr. Rakesh Kumar from CSIR uh, to talk a bit more about one of the sectors that Tejal they they mentioned, which is agriculture, forestry, and land use, a really critical sector, especially also from an Indian perspective. And I think also one where uh, we see uh, the whole topic of negative emissions coming up much more strongly. So over to you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Putwardhan. And uh, there is a lot of uh, discussion already taking place, so I'll try to be as brief as possible. So I'll just share my presentation. Can you all see the presentation? Uh, yes. Thank yes. you. So a few things which I have been asked to speak on uh, would include industries and F2 section, all of these things together, and I'll see how best I can do that. So when you're talking about industry, which, which were a major part of the discussion and the whole negotiation processes, um, you know, it was it was very clear that when we are looking at emissions, we are not only looking at emission, what has happened in the past, but we are also looking at how do you manage the demand related to that. So uh, many times it was difficult to assess, are we talking about all mitigation options or we are talking about part of it and whether it is applicable in one location and all the locations. And that's why some of these numbers, which, which when, when they are being um, you know quoted and being discussed, it gets muddled. So when you're talking about demand management, energy and material efficiency, circular materials flow, abatement technologies, all of these are, late, are actually relating to uh, adoption of new and alternate production processes. And this new and alternate production processes can actually vary from country to country or the state of their industrialization. And, and that, is, that is the reason why these statements which have been made uh, how these can be applied will vary across regions and different materials, but how much of that is linked to which location is something which we need to worry about. So when we talk about other pointers uh, in, in the discussion which, which took place, uh, action to reduce industry sector emission uh, will change with location, and for GHG intensive industry and their value change. Now again, as I just said, it's very, very country specific, now, particularly when we talk about reallocation uh, uh, will have a global distributional effect on employment and economic structure. Uh, it's not only relating to employment and economic structure, but it is also social part of this economic structure. And that is why it becomes significant at national level too, when from state to state, region to region it starts varying. So when you're looking at policy packages, particularly when we talk about socially inclusive phase out plans for emission intensive facilities uh, for just transitions, uh, sometimes the definition itself can vary from country to country. And that was that was discussed many times. And that's why it is important that every country uh, specifically looks at its own definition of the of the words that has been used as of now. So when we look at uh, you know other sector which has been very profoundly and very, very elaborately discussed is urban planning. Uh, when we talk about established and older cities, uh, we are talking about improving, repurposing and retrofitting building stocks. Uh, and and uh, we know that some of these, uh, uh, the older stocks, building stocks, if they have to be replaced with low material energy footprint, it's not only to do a new thing and retrofit, but also how to remove the earlier ones. And 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 uh, these these words are actually very nice targeted infilling uh, processes to be used in older cities. But when we want to start looking at what material is used in which part of the country, which part of the world, uh, can actually change the cost figures as I'll discuss as we go ahead uh, later. Similarly, supporting non-motorized and public transport. Uh, it's, it's not a new thing, uh, particularly developing countries did have their own model of NMT and walking processes, which because of Western influences got muddled. And many times to bring that back uh, on the track uh, is going to be difficult. Something like when, when we say cities, if I can quote here, uh, you know, cities like Chandigarh and Nagpur and similar cities, uh, which was primarily a uh, cycle by cycle cities, now we have uh, retrofitted in a, in a manner that you can't possibly do any of those now. And for all of these, how do we do uh, the finance part of it? And each of these will require local legal reforms. And that's where the real problem happens. 
So similarly, as we go ahead uh, and talk about uh, growing cities, we have similar challenges. And some of the leaf frogging thing that we're talking about having low emission technologies, uh, as we will discuss later again, when we talk about low emission technology, is it for current numbers or are we talking about the whole life cycle part of it? And if there is a life cycle cost, is that something where we have looked at uncertainty in, uncertainty in a better way? For emerging cities, we are talking about people's center of urban design, uh, where we, 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 we would rather say that it is it should be environment services based uh, people centered urban design. And that's where some of these wordings need to be need to be perfectly understood uh, to move forward. So when we talk about older cities, uh, when we talk about changing local rules, uh, land rights and reforms, particularly when we talk about uh, bigger cities and I would say cosmopolitan cities across the world, uh, we have large urban poor who have inadequate energy, water and space and inequity is very, very high. So in terms of per capita inequity is very, very uh, you know significant in these places. And how do we handle that based on the rules and, and the uh, land rights and reforms that we are talking about? So when we talk about emerging cities, we do have a uh, lot of relevance with uh, developed countries, uh, but how to bring relevance to developing countries are equally important. So I'm not going into details here. Uh, these are some numbers which were uh, said and I understand uh, building sector or urban area related sectors where we are talking about cement and steel used uh, is significant and we need to uh, we need to take a very quick and very very deeper look into it if we want to address this so when we go to transport sector again uh, this is a sector where everyone has been talking about that if if we do electrification we will be removing significant amount of uh, greenhouse gases um this electrification costs, uh, we, we all know it, is this going down when we talk about EV, uh, but it is very important to also understand that how do we how do we address the critical minerals which are needed for batteries. Uh, without batteries, many of these uh, over a period of time would, would create a different challenge altogether. And to, to address that, the cost factor or the finance factor is not something which, is, which has been very well specified and, and understood. Biofuels, of course, if it is systemically sourced, can provide the mitigation effort in short and medium terms. And uh, particularly when we talk about technology transfer and financing, uh, it is it is this whole leapfrogging word uh, would require a leapfrogging numbers in terms of finance as well. Uh, the investment word, which was used earlier by my previous uh, previous uh, speakers, is not something which is going to help uh, developing countries. So this is a sector uh, why I'm showing it on a little bigger picture of this uh, is something where it shows the largest uh, amount of GHG reduction potential. And when when we look at all of that, which has been uh, which has been used uh, very effectively in the discussion by certain countries, uh, we realize that though it is it looks like it's a large number, but how do we do it? The details are something which is difficult to understand and what what I would like to highlight here is the barrier of implementation for these, particularly when we look at trade-offs relating to uh, impact of climate change in this whole sector on agriculture, forestry and land use, conflict with food security and livelihoods, complexity of land ownership and management systems. And the major issue is cultural aspects within the state, country and uh, global scale as well. And why I'm saying is that the debate which is happening everywhere is that if I'm maintaining the forest for 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 the country, is that I'm getting compensated uh, locally as well as globally. So this is the graph, the, the 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 figure which has been, I would say, shown everywhere in almost all presentation. Uh, but what is important here to notice here is this is this is affluent section where you see these numbers significantly higher than any other number that we talk about. But there is a whole lot of assumptions which have gone into this. And when we talk about all of these, uh, some of the some other numbers that you see on the bottom uh, right here and uh, the cost figures which have been indicated that the, the mitigation cost of the technology is going to be in the range of zero to twenty dollars, twenty to fifty dollars and something of that kind. Uh, there are a lot of uncertainty uh, which which is which is there in the assumption that has been made on the basis of the costing, as well as scale of its implementation, 
and and that is where all the all the written qualifiers which are there part of this uh, particular figure is something missed out in most of the places when we are discussing it so just to uh, give you an example similarly these and all of these mitigation potential that we are talking about is for 2030 and uh, these two num numbers that you see here wind and solar uh, which is which is something which is well known probably the costs are uh, more robust uh, but for rest of them is is something which we yet to know the scale and the cost that has been quoted here similarly for uh, affluent section as i already mentioned it here uh, then buildings and transport sector what is important here to use is the, all of these these two sectors are actually giving a mitigation uh, potential benefit which is on the lower lower side but the discussion is more on these in the in the text and uh, here i just wanted to highlight say in industry uh, where we look at uh, say fuel switching which gives you the highest uh, benefit uh, or feedstock carbonization which is you know uh, lower side but the moment we talk about carbon capture and utilization and ccs the cost figures are in the range of about 100 to 200 Although these numbers have been used, many of these technologies have not been actually uh, uh, put at scale. And that's why these numbers of 100 or 200 dollars could possibly be 300 to 500 or could be lower, depending upon what kind of R&D we do and how do we move forward. So when we talk about these, these uh, estimates as part of the figure, it is important to remember this not all cheap and easy uh, and finance uh, as it appears. And uh, the most critical component of the whole thing is technology transfer when we talk about it. I just want to share a figure which, which has been recently released by MIT Technology Review, where it puts India in the middle somewhere um, in, in this green future index, which actually calculates with a lot of parameters. Uh, is similar to a lot of assumptions which Tejal talked about, uh, but it's important to notice that some of these uh, countries that you see here, which is on the higher side, uh, is is based on those assumptions which were actually hotly contested in the negotiation processes. So lastly, I just wanted to highlight a few points um, that overuse and high emission of developed countries can be reduced only through transformational policies. And these policy messages uh, directly do not actually apply to developing regions. So the, the policy measures have to be written in the simpler languages which Dr. Bhatt also talked about. Uh, which is applicable and which is which is also understandable to most of the masses that uh, th those who are going to use it. Industry and transport sectors are very hard to abate, as I mentioned it earlier. Uh, it is, it, but it is very essential for growth, and uh, there are a lot of high cost and technology transfer issues. So we we need to understand these barriers, which we, when we are talking about overall reduction of uh, of greenhouse gases. The affluence uh, section, as I said, it has very high potential, uh, but it has many social and economic barriers, and it varies so much. Uh, even in a country like India, uh, probably every state would have a varying degree of uh, uh, policies and, and the, uh, social issues when we talk about it. The cost of many options which have been given in mitigation, uh, industrial sector, affluence sector, um, few life cycle costs are based on too many assumptions. And some of them are straightforward, uh, uh, not 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 of very high confidence. But yes, it's important to start with a number rather than having no number. But it's important to also highlight uncertainty every time when we talk about uh, taking steps. So when we talk about new challenges which are emerging, it's important, particularly when we talk about uh, electrification based on um, renew renewables, or we, when we talk about uh, you know wind and and and. Uh, other renewables together, uh, very rarely we have seen the cost of grid integration, which have been discussed, the material which will get mined for batteries, from where it will come, uh, the, the, the gauge related to that, disposal issues, uh, they have not yet been uh, very clearly, uh, I would say, specified and also discussed in, in the documents that we talked about. So in, in, a, in a way, equity and climate justice, both within and between the countries uh, who are going to do implementation uh, of all of these mitigation options are very, very critical. And in summary, I would say uh, it is important, uh, specific to India and developing countries, uh, that it leads 
from the front, which it has been doing in uh, spe specifically the sector of energy. But it also needs to step up for R&D and studies for global practices, studying other countries. And as uh, Dr. Purnamita Das Gupta also talked about number of papers getting published in a specific sector, uh, that has to be increased only when then the voices get heard, uh, legal and you know valid uh, voices get heard. Uh, Sometimes it's also important in a country like ours where we can we talk about climate change and forget pollution. We, we did discuss air pollution and climate change, but what about other pollution which happens because of many other factors? So do we need to look at uh, social aspect and, and the health aspect of pollution and climate change together? And that has to be internally looked at within the country uh, rather than looking elsewhere. And as every, every speaker spoke about that, the window of action has actually narrowed down quite a bit uh, due to limited carbon budget that we have. And uh, uh, but I would say that e in each of these discussion, individual country has to take its own uh, steps based on the knowledge that has come from everywhere else. So I'll stop here. Thank you very much. I hope I was within the time limit which was going to. Thank you very much, Dr. Kumar. Uh, I think uh, very much appreciate your pointing out some of the difficulties with decarbonization, especially in industry and transport, they are indeed much harder to decarbonize sectors. Uh, and which then obviously brings us to our last and final presentation, which is sort of the elephant in the room, if you will, uh, the whole issue of fossil fuel consumption. 